Pete and I will be sharing to you about our grassroots movement, encouraging the ASEAN region towards sustainable production and manufacturing through the role of arts and culture. So I come from the tropical paradise, Cebu Island. I was born, raised, and currently based there. It's a beautiful island, yet quite recently, I guess around five years back, just a five minute rain pour, it caused massive flooding. And so I felt that as somebody from the creative industry, how can creativity influence everyone or within the city to, to shift their mindset in a way that garbage is actually something that we can work with and not something that we can throw away. I started a campaign called Trashin. So it's trash fashion. So my passion has always been about fashion and now it is now Trashin. So that is how it all started. And so we made a campaign promoting everyone that garbage is not actually garbagey, it's actually beautiful. So over the years we've been doing a lot of art pieces that are focused on, on sustainability. So this is one of the pieces that we did as a reflection about the Great Barrier Reef. And so this piece is made out of um, all PET bottles. And so we created that piece as a reflection towards how we as an archipelagic country would actually take care of our, of our marine biodiversity and, and, and how, how our garbage or consumption actually affects marine, marine biodiversity. I co-founded a nonprofit and our nonprofit is called Youth for Livable Cebu. What we do is that we actually use and leverage on the energy and the creativity of the youth on putting on policies and, 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 and lobbying to our government. So this is one of the instances that I went to our city hall during an official session. So they did not let me in because um, either I was too crazy or, or they, it was, I, was not, I was not dressed properly. So I guess it's both. In any case, so um, what this was about is um, there was a proposal to build a 300 kilowatt um, power plant in our heritage area, in Cebu City, in a residential area. I felt as an environmentalist and, 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 and as an artist, we should make a statement. And so I went there with this trash and piece in our sit city hall with all the councillors doing their session, deliberating, and, and they saw this, okay, wh 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 what is this guy doing? It's like, anyway, so the point of, the point there was that um, what is our role as artists to affect implementive policies in the region? Then again, we have to recall that with the five countries that contribute highest to the Great Pacific Patch, four of these are from the ASEAN region. So how do we as, as, as ASEAN integrate sustainability through the role of arts and culture? And Cebu City Council junked the proposal and what we are trying to say is that we might be dressed in a crazy trash and outfit, but then what we are trying to do is, is implement changes or policies that are actually not for us, because at the end of the day, we have to leave this earth better than how we have inherited it. And perhaps that is always the role of us as creatives and artists, and not just us, but everyone here. What, are, what we are trying to implement is how can we make promoting um, sustainability in not in a gloom and doom kind of messaging, but then how can we make it, again, sexy? So the point there is, yes, how can we make it sexy? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Pranithan Pit Ponprafa, and um, I'm from Bangkok, Thailand. My journey to sustainability is through an arts and lifestyle event called Wonderfruit. I was actually quite lucky though because my, my dad founded an environmental project 25 years ago uh, called Think Earth. <clears throat> and um, growing up I was exposed, uh, very much so. I was brought about planting trees and restoring coral reefs and going to university lectures. But I, I felt it was rewarding, I was 10 years old, but I also felt quite distant from it. I felt like it was, it was work, you know, he, he would give me a reward after I would go with him or something, buy me a, 
toy or something. So, you know, it felt like, like a chore. And fast forward, you know, 15, 20, 20 years later, I came back from studying abroad. I came back um, to my country. You know, it was uh, unrecognizable. It had gone through such rapid development, and um, both physically and mentally. And I felt that, you know, I, I wanted to do something uh, for it. And I wanted to do something in the same way how the economic development was, in that, you know, it was it became something unsexy, right? So as, as Francis said, and how to make sustainability um, you know, popular. How can we integrate it a little bit more seamlessly into every day, every, everyone's lives? So you know, popular culture, stuff like art, music, fashion, food, things that people do um, every day, you know? and how could we integrate sustainability into that? We came about the concept of creating an, an event based on that to bring about the community. Um, based on that. And um, I, th I think at the core of Wonder Fruit, really, it's about the community. We're, we're generalists. We're not really experts in, in any field, but we're a platform for that. But we bring about, we work with um, scientists, we work with uh, architects, artists, farmers, um, entrepreneurs, and we bring about a, a big community with a common denominator of um, you know, creating impact. But we're doing it in a way that really is, I, I feel, is quite relevant, or at least relevant to me. Um, speaking to a generation through music and fashion and food and everything else that they, you know, we seem to not be able to not live without. So I, I'll just give you some examples of what we've done through it. This is a stage we built last year. It's a stage completely made out of rice. If you're familiar with Thailand, like 20 years ago in the Isan area, they used to build these things called rice castles. And they used to build them to give thanks to the, to the rain. Um, they no longer build them because of industrialized farming, so there's no need to build them. So we wanted to provoke a cultural ceremony, but do it on a very large scale. So we have a farm, we, we've grown rice, and we built a stage completely out of rice. I mean, it arguably could be the world's most sustainable stage because um, the, the rice, we can eat the rice after, which we plan to do this year by working with celebrity chefs. We work with Michelin star chefs to farmers. So the breadth and depth is, is very wide and we could, you know, we bring again that common denominator. We do talks similar to this. We call them uh, scratch talks or philosophy is like, if it itches, scratch it. <laughs> so this film is on Netflix now. It's called Plastic Oceans. So he debuted uh, this at, at Wonder Fruit. Uh, Craig is the director, you know, again, wellness. I think with the concept of wellness, it's like, it, it's in people's nature to look after themselves, right? So we're trying to instill that, that philosophy to in the environment as well. But how can we create the value of what the environment can give back? That's, that's something that we're communicating through our community now. So, you know, this whole farm, farm to feast movement, people are exposed to the produce, they're exposed to the chefs, but then, you know, maybe they forget about the, the, the people behind it. So, we, so these uh, collective of uh, Thailand young farmers, they call it, their ambition is to be like, make farming sexy. So again, you know, we're bringing about that community. They're like the Thailand's uh, rock and roll farmers. Again, we're family friendly. So you know, a lot of our activities are geared towards kids. We work with like trash workshops. We do trash walks. I mean, we had the bye-bye plastic bag girls from Bali. We signed petitions that you know, they respond to, uh, trying to make Bali plastic free. This is our solar stage uh, made completely out of uh, reclaimed wood. It's like a modular Lego. So anyways, um, we believe that uh, creativity, looking at it as a solution, then just like Francis said, how can you address these things with um, optimism, with, um, with fun? And, um, you know, obviously it's a very serious issue we're dealing with. But our, our interpretation of it is to bring about the best innovation and solutions um, behind that. We've been working with everything from, as I mentioned, farming techniques to we introduced the concept of uh, creating a natural capital asset where you buy a drink and you get a tree and it's based on the blockchain so the tree is actually you could convert it um, on, a, on a platform into cash as well. So there's a lot of quite cutting edge stuff behind it as well but the common denominator as, as I have explained is, is really um, you know, how, how to create creative sustainability. I am drawing a conclusion that the young are not, will not be so keen to enter a business at entry level. It's all about money. So how do you make money from all this? That's a very good question because we always have that hashtag starving artists or starving creatives. I'm speaking on my behalf. So I do have sculptures and art which are being commissioned. Yet I also do um, 
products such as this. I create um, clothes, clothing out of, with, with the sensibility of sustainability because I only work with, I work with indigenous um, communities where their process is very low on carbon footprint, of uh, carbon impact. So like for example, this jacket that I'm wearing, it has a plique of Tinalak fabrics from the Tiboli tribe. So we go to their communities. And so one is being an artist on sculptures and, and whatnot. And the other one is to create functional wearable clothing. So there's, and that is where I can generate profit. So I guess it is also similar to a lot of millennial artists, at least from where I come from in Cebu. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, good, good question. I'm, I'm, I also think like, you know, with, with these things, if, it, um, if it's at the core of what you do and it's not a byproduct, then you start at, with sustainability as, as, as the core, then it's the fundamental for your business. So I think like a, a lot of the issues may be that people are trying to uh, come with it at an angle where it's like they're trying to, um, you know, uh, it, it becomes like almost a, like a CSR uh, project rather than, than informing the... The, the fundamentals of it. So for Wonder Food, for example, we work with a lot of big companies. We have a zero, like, like the World Economic Forum, we have a zero logo policy, which is very unique in Asia. And they support us, um, and our retention has been very high with big brands, uh, most of the major brands in, in Thailand, banks, um, alcohol companies, insurance, uh, property development, and we have uh, no logos on site. So what do we do? We create experiences with them. And that, that way, it's creating value throughout, throughout the system. And also, obviously, for us, we, we sell tickets um, and uh, we sell food and drinks and stuff like that. You uh, talk about sustainability in your architecture and like, you know, the culture behind Wonderfruit. How is that reflected in your music bookings? Like, how is sustainability part of the music? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, fr frankly, we have six pillars, right? We have art, music, uh, fashion, wellness, uh, farm to fees. Th that, that's, the one, that's the most difficult one. Music for us is, is a trap. Without the headliners, people won't pay attention. So we're trying to target people who don't care about sustainability. That's the ambition. And we're kind of, how do you make them care, right? And they want to come see their favorite act or they want to, you know, and then when they do come, then they notice that the whole stage is made of reclaimed materials. They notice that we're doing these uh, one drink, one tree based on this blockchain. I mean, we're exposing them to like stuff that traditionally they won't care about. But we, we do a program uh, uh, called Intermission where we give up and coming acts. Uh, the opportunity to play alongside, you know, very, um, headliners. We do it with a famous uh, producer, actually, and um, it's his way of giving back. So, so music is a tough one in terms of sustainability, um, but it's something that we're also trying to, um, we're trying to crack that one as well. So, I have one comment here, which is connecting or achieving sustainability via the empowerment. I mean, finding where you get your uh, material and finding these simple farmers and giving them that stage and giving them that, uh, uh, let's say, basic income uh, is one thing. But I would add to it the, the connectivity and the, the, you know, the stage that you are giving them. So the empowerment is not only financial. And this goes with the theme of this, uh, 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 of this uh, uh, forum how can we utilize digitalization? How can we utilize technology? And how can that give the right impact? So all, all in all, I think it's a perfect example of all what we are discussing in this forum, all put in uh, one great job. Thank you so much. We're now in the fourth industrial revolution and how could um, indigenous, indigenous communities from mountainsides actually have their products represented? And so that is actually our role in our in our in our organization, where we leverage on branding, on 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 on, on e-commerce through other networks. So, yet then again, we also do a lot of product design development because at the end of the day, if they are still producing the same souvenir items, which are on the profit margin quite very low, so and then they don't have the access. How do you build scale? And how do you source your materials when the scale does happen? That is a very good question, in fact. Because um, one of, uh, I'll just put it in a story. Uh, because uh, one of my interns, well, did not listen properly. So she had an issue with sourcing. My model is that I work with commercial establishments because they have curated garbage. 
So you know for a fact that this is their garbage output and that is resource input for you. So I work closely with them because they would still be producing as long as they have business. And there will always be garbage from their, from their manufacturing. And so that is my model. I work with the commercial establishments and then we work with designers and artists. You said that uh, the people that you target to participate in the festival are those that don't necessarily have the sustainability mindset. Are you able to measure in any way after participating in the festival? Do they leave with a change in their mindset? Do they uh, change you know, some of their lifestyle habits? Um, are you able to measure it in any way? Have you seen the impact that you've, you've made? No, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's that, you know it's um it's something we we've been working on as well. But what we did notice, like in the event space in Thailand after after Wonder Food has happened, most events now ban plastic. Most events build out of recycled materials. Most events are shifting towards, you know. But but again, I think like these are like a byproduct, right? They're they're maybe they're doing it um, for um, perception or. But e either way, it's um you know we're we're seeing this um this change in terms of. The, the consumer coming, yeah, I think it's still quite difficult for us to measure beyond the four days, you know, but we do give out, like, we do give out uh, plast uh, uh, water bottles and stuff like that as well, so, you know, every time we see a Wonder Fruit water bottle, then we're like, yeah, that's one, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's one step in the right direction. <laughs>